Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Express. I'm Nina Gopal. This is the new Indian Express's weekly interaction with experts, where we analyze the impact of developments in our backyard, on our neighborhood, on India. Do click on the new Indian Express website and tweet and follow Global Express. So today we're looking at what is definitely turning into one of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's biggest diplomatic challenges in recent times. What must India do now? We have eight former Indian naval officers, two ex-Navy captains, five commanders, and one sentence, one sailor, all sentenced to death last week for espionage by a court in Doha in, in the Gulf country of Qatar. The case has sent shockwaves across the country. They've been under arrest since they were detained in August uh, 2022, which is uh, 15 months ago. And the verdict was pronounced not in a country that India has a confrontational relationship with, as it does with Pakistan, where Kulbushan Yadav, another former naval officer, uh, uh, faces the death end sentence for espionage. This is with Qatar, a Gulf nation where over 700,000 Indians work and live as law-abiding citizens, a Gulf nation that is India's biggest supplier of natural gas, we built five gas terminals to import LNG and LPG from Qatar through the Indian government company Petronet LPG. Our bilateral trade stands at about $15 billion. Talking us through this maze of questions on what lies ahead and what India should be doing to uh, for, the, for the jailed Indians who have been said to be training the Qatari Navy, and whether we have actually used enough of our diplomatic heft to uh, get them, uh, you know, some kind of leeway is former ambassador K.P. Fabian, who served in Qatar. He was posted to Tehran during the Iranian Revolution. He was the coordinator for the evacuation of over 170,000 Indians from Iraq and Kuwait during the first Gulf War in 1990-1991. He's an author. He's a columnist. His last book was on the Arab Spring. And now it almost looks as if the Arab, that uh, we're in the throes of another cataclysmic meltdown in the Arab world, an Arab sort of Armageddon, so to speak. Welcome, Ambassador Fabian. Our second guest is Manish Tiwari. He's a member of parliament who represents uh, Anandpur Sahib in, in uh, Punjab. Uh, he, th that's where some of the jail sailors come from. He was a minister in Man Manmohan Singh's uh, government. More importantly, he's a legal eagle. He's a lawyer. He has repeatedly taken up the issue of the naval officers, saying the onus is on our government to get their sentences commuted, to bring them home. Mr. Tiwari raised the uh, matter in Parliament on December 7th last year, to which the External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar has responded with a letter on December 23rd. Before we ex explore the key question, on whether we have have or haven't done enough uh, for these uh, for these eight men, let me name them. There's Captain Navtej Singhil, Captain Saurabh Vashisht, Commander Purnendu Tiwari, Captain Birendra Kumar Varma, Commander Sugunakar Pakala, Commander Sanjeev Gupta, Commander Amit Nagpal, and Sailor Ragesh. Our deepest sympathies. We stand with you. So let's begin with you, Ambassador Fabian. Would you like to tell us as a diplomat whether we've done enough, uh, you know, to, uh, was this was this sentence by a Qatari court, a lower, was it a huge shock? Was it expected, unexpected? Could... Well, Ambassador, are you there? Okay. So your question is whether we have done enough. Well, my answer is in two parts. One is that in such matters, the Ministry of External Affairs might consider it prudent not to tell the whole world, you know, about all that it has done. It, there has to be some discretion. But having said that, my guess is that we have not done enough. Let me explain. You know that uh, our vice president was uh, in Doha in June this year? Yes. All right. Now, this matter was not taken up, at least as far as the media reports go. It was said that it was a brief visit and there was no time. Well, however brief the visit is, 
this matter should have been uppermost in our mind. I agree. And a vice president should not have gone there unless he wanted to and he could have taken it up. Okay. Absolutely. That's point number one. Now, at that time, if you remember, there was uh, much concern in Qatar about some statements made by a BJP spokesperson, Nurup Sharma. Nupur Sharma, yes. My apologies for not getting her name right. That's okay. She made statements which should not have been made. Point. Absolutely. And Qatar was annoyed. And if you remember, the Indian ambassador was summoned, even while yes. the vice president was in town. There is also the story of uh, the Amir's uh, not hosting a lunch for the vice president. That's right, it was cancelled. Yeah, you know, there again, there is a little need for nuance. Mm. Before the vice president left, there was an agreed program, mm -hmm. and that agreed program, there was no lunch. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was there in yeah. that draft program earlier. So but, you're basically you're basically saying that you know, despite the good trade relations and the fact that you know we make up the majority of the expatriates who live in uh, in the Gulf in that Gulf country, uh, our relations have not been exactly smooth since in the last year or so. No, let me let me sort of uh, go, uh, make this point. So at that time, we invited the Amir to make a state visit to India. That was a smart mm. move. Now, mm. as far as I can understood, I can understand the Qataris uh, thanked us for the invitation, but mm. showed no alacrity in fixing the dates. Mm. In other words, mm. a clear signal that the Amir was not going to come in the immediate future. Therefore, now here comes where I think we have failed. Therefore, mm. it should have been good diplomacy on our part at the time of G20 to invite the entire GCC, all the six members of the GCC. And there, you know that Saudi Arabia doesn't need an invitation. It is a member of G20. Now, we invited only UAE. Mm. Now, on the other hand, if we had invited all of them, and, you know, in such matters, sometimes you even send a, a special envoy to carry the invitation and all that, you know. If uh, the host governments are used to such protocol, just observe it. You know what I mean? It's a question of uh, doing in Rome what the Romans do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. we had done that, the Amir would have certainly come for the G20. And that was a time when Prime Minister Modi and the Amir could have had a, you know, a conversation one to one and we could have made progress you know what I mean? that was a major well in my opinion major fault on the part of ministry of external affairs i i i think we should we tend to we will agree with you ambassador fabian because there was there does seem to have been a major time lapse or almost as if it wasn't a top priority uh, Manish, if I can bring you in, uh, you know, would you like to uh, come in on the fact that uh, uh, that you know the families, they've reached out to you, uh, you know, did you do you feel that we have failed to step in and provide uh, the kind of legal counsel that we should have? Uh, and, you know, I mean, two vice presidents, as uh, Ambassador Fabian said, visited Doha, while the investigation must have been ongoing. And I believe our national security advisor is also supposed to have visited Doha. Uh, you know, so tell me what 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 your thoughts are on the subject. Well, Lena, I find it uh, completely and absolutely mystifying. And the reason why I say that is because, irrespective of how different uh, legal and judicial systems may be in different countries, but there are. Mm -hmm certain canons of natural jurisprudence which are intrinsic and embedded in any uh, legal or judicial system in order to ensure uh, impartiality and in order to ensure objectivity insofar as the process is concerned. Now, if you were to rewind back, somewhere in the month of July or August, 
these people were picked up in a midnight swoop. Mm. The information that surfaced was when one of the relatives of one of the officers who ostensibly had been detained yeah. uh, actually reached out publicly seeking help. And uh, slowly and gradually, it came to the fore that these uh, eight officers, some of them extremely decorated officers, were being held in solitary confinement. And these are That's not right. people. These are people who are retired, who are possibly in their mid-60s or late-60s, and therefore, obviously, would have all the attendant health issues, which come with an... Uh, uh, and an advanced age, if I can put it in those words. Yeah. And therefore, at that particular point in time also, it was very unclear as to why they had been detained. There were mm. some public reports with regard to, you know, certain things which they allegedly uh, may have done or may not have done. But there was nothing substantive in terms of the charges. Which what does the families tell you? What well, were the said, ones that who've spoken to you? What have they told you? Well, essentially, what they said was that they were not aware as to why they had been detained. Mm. And even when I raised this matter in Parliament, uh, I think in the other house, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar made a statement to the effect, which I think is available. Uh, if you were to Google it, saying that the matter is extremely sensitive. That's now, right. obviously, uh, by the December of 2022, government was at least aware of the intrinsic sensitivity, quote-unquote, sensitivity in the matter. And from December, we fast forward to October, and then you have this death sentence. Yeah. So it, and, and even today, even as we speak, the yeah. judgment is not in the public domain. And mm. going by whatever reports are available, it uh, suggests that there were apparently a record three hearings. And eight there were. And there were eight, three. That's what, uh, that, that's, that's, that's the, 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 the uh, information which is in the public domain subject to correction. And eight people have been sentenced to death. Now, you know, there is an intrinsic injustice in the manner in which this entire process has unfolded. Yeah. Presume for a moment, hypothetically speaking, that, you know, the Qatari government had certain concerns with regard to their national security allegedly have been breached. But the mm -hmm. rules of national, uh, natural justice uh, ordain that at least the family members should have been informed what the charges were against them. And then uh, once the court arrived at a certain conclusion, uh, irrespective of the fact that it's a completely erroneous conclusion, because even if you go by uh, Qatari law, at least that is what I have been informed, a death sentence is only handed out where there is material harm to somebody's person which ends up getting committed. Oh. So, therefore, it, it, it all does not really square up from a purely legal and jurisprudential uh, uh, standpoint. And what See, on that, the, on that what I'd the, just like to say it also was, was uh, pronounced, that this, this judgment was pronounced by a lower court, the lowest court of all. Well, you see, the fact is that irrespective of whichever court uh, pronounced the judgment, the moot question is whether they were given a fair trial or not. And that does not seem to be clearly the case by whatever reports are available in the public space. And even today, you do not have a copy of the judgment. What your yeah. colleagues inform me who've actually gone on to the website of the court of first instance, there are various judgments, some of them in English, but this judgment is not there. Yeah, so the court of first it, instance normally normally produces a judgment in Arabic. Yeah, but apparently there are some judgments there in English also. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even if the judgment was in Arabic, had it been uploaded, it would have been translated. And the facts would have been before 
all of us and before the country as to what are the charges against them. So as of today, we do not know as to why they were detained, what they were charged with, you know, why they have been sentenced to death, which in any jurisprudence happens in the rarest of rare cases. And mm. Ambassador Fabian has is explained at length as to how government of India could have intervened since the external affairs minister admitted that the matter was sensitive. You know, I can understand that obviously they do not want to uh, make everything that they do public. But as I understand, even after the death sentence, subject to correction, I don't even think that the Katri ambassador was called in and uh, a protest note or some kind of a protest formally by the government of India, except the statement which the MEA spokesperson put out, has yeah. really been done. So, yeah. so, so, so the whole thing doesn't add up and my heart goes out to all those eight men who are now facing a death sentence and, and their, their families. families who would be dying a thousand deaths every moment. That's true. That's true. But Ambassador Fabian, if I can get you in uh, on that point, what do you think the steps would be that the Indian government should initiate? I mean, they've sent the uh, former Indian ambassador of to Qatar, Deepak Mittal, uh, back to Qatar to, uh, you know, plead the case, uh, cause, I presume, of the uh, of the sailors. Uh, what do you, do you think it should come from a higher level? Because, I mean, Mr. Jay Shankar has also visited Qatar. Uh, you know, and what can Deepak Mittal do? Is it a one-on-one, -on -one, a one-to-one -one with, you know, which, uh, which I mean, he probably knows people in Qatar. Is that why he's been sent back? Uh, before I answer that question, I want to clarify one or two matters. Yeah. You must have seen the statement by the naval chief the other day. Yes, yes. He's waiting for the translated transcript from MEA. Mm. In other words, Indian Embassy had appointed a legal team. We mm. didn't that the legal team knows, knew their Arabic. And there were seven hearings. Oh, not three. Starting from March. Okay. And Obviously, our legal team would have told our embassy what was happening. So, yeah. to give the impression that the trial was absolutely opaque and all that is incorrect. And secondly, this is not the occasion, best occasion to find fault with the Qatari legal system. We mm. have to be prudent. You know, we got very tough with Canada. And I think it yeah. was I think it was it's, foolish. Now that's here, blown up in our face, you're saying. I, I, in a coming to, uh, to answer your question, I would say that we have four options. Mm. One is follow the legal process. There's a court of appeal. And mm -hmm. some time back, that court of appeal reduced to life imprisonment, a death sentence awarded to a Filipino for espionage. Oh, I see. No, and there were three. I let me explain. Yeah, One who was given death sentence was working for Qatar Petro General Petroleum, and the mm -hmm. other two were working for the Qatari Air Force. Now it seems uh, those two who were working for the Qatari Air Force they got uh, fifteen years or twenty years or whatever it was. What but nationality were the ambassador? Other guy who was working for Qatar General Petroleum because he was a conduit. You yeah. know, passing on the information, he got life's I mean, death sentence in the lawyer court. And the court of appeal amended it to life sentence. In other words, there is reason to believe that Qatar has a system that delivers justice. Mm. Mm. Second, as already pointed out by uh, Mr. Tiwari, we should pursue the diplomatic option. Hmm. may have, but we have to pursue it. And he's very right when he says, I mean, one way would have been to send the foreign minister the next day. Yeah. Done. And summon the country ambassador, you know, things like that. This shows activist foreign policy. Okay? Yeah. Not like Sushma Swaraj did. No, that is one. But uh, my belief is that ultimately we might get relief only by asking for 
pardon at the level of the Amir. And you cannot ask for pardon when the legal process is still on. I see, I see. So yeah, that's interesting. That's important. Yeah. Your interest to have the legal process concluded as early as possible mm. and make the formal request for a pardon. Mm. Which, uh, I mean, ambassador can make it and all that, you know, but it should be followed up by a summit level meeting, preferably offline between the Amir and the Prime Minister. And the best we can hope for is a pardon at the time of uh, Ramadan next year. That is March. Oh, not even not even Qatari National Day on, on December 18th? This time, that is in December. Uh, as I said, technically the legal process has to be over before you ask for pardon. I mean, imagine President of India being asked to pardon somebody whose case is uh, still being considered by Supreme Court. So, I mean, you know, there are certain... But uh, ambassador, ambassador, the other problem is that we don't have an ambassador in Qatar. We haven't replaced Deepak Mittal. Well, and I, we've also, we also recalled our defense attache, apparently, the man who, uh, know, we, who knows the inner inside story. I mean, I'll get to that inside story in a minute, but uh, don't you think we should appoint an ambassador? Well, I, would, I don't want to comment on the obvious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is the <laughs> obvious. Yesterday or day for yesterday's, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, and is that, is that, is that the final, final you said you no, have four. Second. No, the last option we have, yeah. which is not the best option, and I don't advise it, is to engage uh, with friendly governments, starting from the United States, to put pressure and on Iran. But I will not advise that, because Qatar would prefer to talk to us and take the matter to the ICJ. Again, I wouldn't advise that. And above all, please remember, Qatar has a young Amir, he's 43 years, and mm. he ended the blockade. Yes, so, he did. And very well. He did, he did. You won't damage indo qatari relations by executing these eight men. No, but we, we also were very good during the blockade, right? I mean, we were, we were the people who actually, uh, you know, um, we, we didn't take part in that blockade of, of Qatar. Of no, we supplied goods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We continue to supply the goods. Okay, if I can just get back to you, uh, Mr. Tiwari, you know, the charges have not been made public. That is true. It's not been, uh, it's not in the public domain, but uh, the families have all said to us, I mean, the family members that I have spoken to have said to me uh, that uh, the charges are supposedly of espionage now that and, and spying for israel you know uh, these eight men were in charge they also uh, used the uh, they also worked for a company called uh, you know um, uh, what, what was it which which basically it was a was a company which was headed by an Omani naval officer, Dahara Global Technologies. Uh, it was headed by a naval officer from Oman and a Qatari major general. Uh, so they were both former military officers and they were uh, in talks or in consultation with a Italian company. And then later on, uh, you know, a couple of other shipbuilding Italian companies. And basically it was to help the Qatari Navy set up a, a proper submarine uh, you know facility and the original plan was to have two uh, small submarines now the charge that has been that that has been made public by uh, the financial times which is a very reputable newspaper is that dara global was a front for the cia and mossad that both the omani chief and its qatari head worked for the deep state uh, I mean, other newspapers have said this, not not the uh, Financial Times, uh, but other newspapers have said this, and that they were they wanted to keep an eye on Doha's acquisition to give teeth to its navy, uh, and that was basically what was the problem because the, being naval officers, they must have been social animals. They must have opened up about it at you know at various uh, you know I don't know whether at you know em embassy functions or so on. This must have all been you know, stuff, fuel, which 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 brought about the suspicion that these men were uh, were spying. Uh, has the, have the families uh, 
uh, shared this with you, Mr. Tabani, their, uh, their fears, their deep fears? Look, Nina, I am a lawyer. And uh, in a matter as sensitive as this, especially as when, uh, I don't know, as, as sensitive as uh, eight people being sentenced to death, I refuse to react to any speculation. Hmm. Till the time I do not see the papers for myself. And therefore, when I talked about opacity in, uh, uh, in judicial systems, and the underlying principles of natural justice, which run across uh, all legal systems, irrespective of whatever legal traditions or wellsprings they come from. The first and foremost thing which you do is that you at least inform the next of kin yeah. as to what they have been charged with. Right? Yeah. In India also, if somebody is charged under the Official Secrets Act, yeah. right, when a charge sheet is filed in a court of law, that charge sheet is not a private document. And ultimately, a charge sheet is nothing more uh, than facts and circumstances as best understood by an investigating officer. Mm -hmm. It has no more legal sanctity than that. So therefore, under these circumstances, you do not have a memo of arrest, which has been given to the next of kin. At least it is not in the public domain. You do not have uh, a charge sheet which lays out what are the charges against them. Ultimately, as Ambassador Fabian said, that even if seven hearings took place, uh, are seven hearings adequate enough uh, for eight people to present their best defense before they are given the sentence of death. Even in countries which have extremely rigid legal systems, the death penalty is something you are very, very careful and circumspect about when you are sitting in a judicial capacity. So therefore, it all does not add up. And for me to react to speculation as to what the charges could be based upon something which may have appeared in a certain newspaper, howsoever credible or uncredible it might be, I don't think is the appropriate thing to do. And that is why I have been repeatedly saying that, look, now you have a death sentence. Put the judgment out in the public space. Let, let people know as to what exactly did they do which invited a penalty, which is the harshest penalty which can be given to a human being. What are the families telling you? Because I've also been told, uh, Manish, that some of them, have were, the ones who were in solitary, apparently have lost a lot of weight. And now at least that solitary <clears throat> confinement has been lifted. So they're sharing rooms, two, of, two to a room. But some of them are in very poor health. Have have they have families conveyed that to you? Well, essentially, uh, when they had come and met me uh, initially, when this whole thing started off, that was their principal concern. Mm -hmm. That there are elderly people, they have health issues, you know, they require regular medication and solitary confinement at any age, an extended solitary confinement can play havoc with your mind. And yeah, so therefore, they've also, but haven't they also told and, and, you that they've been and, given... And therefore, therefore, you can get anybody to sign any piece of paper which is self-incriminating. You know, essentially... Oh, that's an to, interesting uh, point. Essentially yeah. to, uh, you know, essentially to get out of that uh, predicament at that moment. And if the charges were indeed so grave, how is it that the Omani National who was ostensibly the chair of that company, was released on bail yeah. and allowed to go back to Oman. Yeah. I think the other Katri gentleman that you mentioned, which at least yes. I was not aware of, I thought there was only one owner, uh, he's also been released on bail. Yeah, so, he's a major general. So, so, so therefore, you know, you have already split the culpability, whereby mm. those who were 
charged with the responsibility of that of managing that particular company at the apex level have been allowed to go off and these eight gentlemen ranging from a sailor to former captains of the indian navy decorated officers who obviously knew the rules of the game since they wore an indian naval uniform for over uh, three decades of their lives would not have been cavalier uh, about as, sharing information yeah as the suggestion being put out in the in, in the public domain and that's why right from day one i have been saying it does not add up it seems but manish they do they say seems, that there's but they it, say they have electronic evidence which means it must be a uh, tap telephone calls uh, you know transcripts of uh, what they said the thing is you can't do a criminal trial uh, nina with leaks peeps and squeaks okay it's a good one a, yeah, yeah yeah you're you're dealing with the lives of eight uh, human beings you know yeah, you can't yeah. uh, put out source based information and say that we have this evidence we have that evidence they are accused of this they are accused of that it has to be a formal charge i mean ambassador fabian can possibly educate me because i do not understand the qatari legal system but in fact that's the question i was going to ask but, but the but the but the little law that i understand i think there are certain basic steps which are common to every legal and judicial system yeah yeah so ambassador fabian that's a good point that uh, manish has brought up uh you know i mean we've all faced it whenever we've been uh, you know come up against uh, the authorities in uh, in the gulf countries we are actually uh, facing that uh, you know that wall of language because you know we the judgments are pronounced in arabic the arguments are made in arabic and uh, unless there is a, a immediate legal translation you are very much in the dark about uh, you know what is actually being said and pronounced so do you do you think we we have to uh, step up that i mean when you were ambassador what was it like must well, it couldn't have changed that much well i mean the, you know many palestinians and egyptians were uh, in positions of responsibility without technical knowledge mm. only because they knew arabic and our people yes. know arabic but that apart let me once again repeat the naval chief must have by now got the long you know translated translation proceedings so there yeah. is something on record well i'm not aware of it but there is something on record and when the trial started in march 2023 the prosecution would have presented its case and mm. i am sure that the legal team appointed by the uh, company i'm sorry by our embassy would know their arabic that's <laughs> right okay so you're right much more there than meets the eye that's okay? right that's right that's and right and one so, more point you mentioned about uh, mossad and cia now i do not know but i find it difficult to take it seriously because america has its biggest air base in aludeda base which we and, have flown out of many and, times yes and america doesn't need uh, all these uh, secret ways of finding out what yes. the countries are doing and it doesn't and secondly why should israel be interested there is no hostility between israel and qatar are you sure about that yes no, no because no because there is there is there is a lot not hostility but there is a lot of sort of question marks over over where israel and the uh, palestinians are concerned because i mean Qatar, for 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 all uh, purposes, does have very close relations with Iran, and Iran does not uh, view the ri- the rise of Israel and the fact that Israel was mending fences and building bridges with the Saudi Arabia and with the UAE and Bahrain and so on. It wasn't viewed at all, uh, you know. And I think Qatar does not uh, view it. Uh, I mean, takes the same view as Iran on that matter. so yeah. there is that element there is that element uh, uh, to our relationship or plus india has signed the i2u2 agreement which i don't think went down well with with uh, doha either because you know it sort of propped up india with alongside israel and saudi yes and the united states which is which which has a very strong relationship with doha as well so there is there are slight uh, you know sort of smudges on that perfect document there is 
no smooth sailing there. Well, two points. I will be most surprised if Qatar sends its submarines to the Eastern Mediterranean. <laughs> okay, I don't think there is any question. Second, you see, you mentioned about Iran and all that. Yes. Well, even then, Qatar is not going to, uh, what shall I say, pass death sentences on eight Indians as a response to what? No, not, not, not that. Well, I didn't mean that. Let us not, let us not link things which are not linked. Yeah, but, yeah. And that is very important. That's right. That's right. I don't think it has an it has an impact. But the way that Qatar views India after the ITU two and after uh, the IMEC, the India Middle East, uh, you know, Europe corridor, I I'm sure that must have changed the way they look at us. I mean, Qatar I, does see itself as uh, you know as uh, an, a, a very leading power in the Gulf. Uh, you know, it doesn't see itself uh, as lesser in any way than Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So I think in that sense, it's, you know, maybe we didn't give it the importance that it deserved or uh, that we gave, gave a lot of importance to Saudi Arabia and, and, the, and the United Arab Emirates with due, due reason, uh, due cause. But the fact that we didn't give that much importance to Qatar must... Uh, you know, must not have gone down well with the Amir. I beg to differ in the sense that uh, I just want to give give you one last one last chance to tell you what you're going to do. What is it that you personally are going to do on behalf of these uh, naval veterans? Nothing. Just keep raising the issue. Just try and see that uh, this uh, concern remains uh, square and center in both uh, official and public consciousness so that we are able to get our people back home. See, mm -hmm. this is not a he said, she said, and this is not the time when you want to score brownie points when the lives of eight of your uh, very senior naval officers are at stake. But yes, I think their cause will be served by continuing to raise the issue and keeping it up and center and square in both public consciousness and the official consciousness. So, Ambassador, if I can come back to you. So, you're saying that the enormous goodwill that India enjoyed through our soft power, our Bollywood movies, you know, uh, and that that has that there is a there is a question mark now. I think because of our even uh, I mean I I don't think it's got anything to do with the sentence uh, at all. But we have I think shifted our uh, position in the Gulf to a great extent by backing Israel as we have uh, over the Hamas, uh, you know, uh, attack on October 7th. I mean, we've been, we've sympathized with the Palestinians and their plight. But the fact is our Qatar's two arch rivals in the Gulf are Saudi Arabia and UAE. So, you know, the I2U2 may have changed perceptions in Doha to a great to an extent. And it, it did translate. I mean, it, we did see how the vice president, Dhankar, uh, you know, he did he did get the cold shoulder, so to speak. You know, I mean, we've had the past, we've had Manmohan Singh visit in 2003. You've had the former Amir visiting. Uh, you've had Modi visiting in 2016. So all of that has been there. Jay Shankar himself has visited Doha several times. But do you think that, you know, this... India Qatar Defense Cooperation Agreement and all of these things, you know, our ships regularly dock in Qatar. All of that has stand, sort of there's a shadow cast over all of that with this judgment. Okay, now first of all, it is a judgment. It's a judicial judgment. It is not a decision by the government of Qatar. Point number one. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yes, you're right. You're right. Point number two. I do not believe that uh, there is going to be imminent execution of these eight Indians. No, I don't think we should sort of uh, create a hysteria. As I said, we have to behave calmly and most smartly diplomatically. Uh, our friends. So you, you, so you have support the idea. You support the the, the, the Mr. Jay Shankar's, uh, uh, you know, asking the families not to make a big noise in public about it. Well, I'll tell you that is. Well, I understand that. I mean, they should. We should not make. Uh, what shall I say? I mean, to put it uh, in plain English, don't repeat what we did with Canada. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't make any sense. 
okay we have to move calmly and smartly okay and let's see who in qatar makes the ultimate decision the amir hmm. okay after the court process is over all right as i said i repeat he is 43 hmm. very see you i have uh, heard him a number of times at the doha forum oh i see so you do know him personally yeah and uh, i am going again in december for the doha mm. forum okay mm. Mm. so in terms of diplomatic skills qatar doesn't lack anything yeah. and it doesn't react uh, uh, what shall i say impulsively oh it you too so we have to do something about it or uh, this so called uh, india middle east uh, europe economic corridor and nina you and i know these are two ideas originating from washington to get saudi arabia and israel closer that's right okay so let us not get too excited about this corridor again the eastern cor i'm sorry western corridor might be of some help to us Yeah, then Gordon Road is less interesting for us because it's better to use the Suez Canal, avoiding too many transshipments. That's right. That's right. Well, it's not you know. I mean, I'm sorry to say, analysis in the Indian media tends to be shallow at times. Yeah, yeah. It, because but because you're fed this uh, fed the story. Yeah. Anyway, which which, which so you, that yeah is, that is what it is. So. as i said let us be calm let us use diplomacy and as necessary summit diplomacy because it works and i am convinced that the young amir is not going to execute these eight people you i know. hope what you say is is uh, yeah. you know good is, will stand you good wouldn't, you wouldn't like to damage indo qatar relations <laughs> because if he does it will damage his relations for a while yeah He, No, it's not in his nature. Yeah, yeah. No, we also have very good relations with Tehran. I mean, you served there at the height of the revolution. You know, I mean, India's India's invested in Chabahar, even if it hasn't gone anywhere. Don't you think we should use Iran as well? I mean, we have the you we we don't we do that won't work. No, let me put it this way: Were I Qatar, I would like India to talk to me directly, hmm. talking to me through others. No, I mm. wouldn't. No, respect mm. Qatar. It's a small mm. country, but respect it. Okay, and treat them, and you will get the results. Going through third countries, well, may not work. And yeah. I'm, I'm not sure whether Iran will get involved, unless it has reason to believe that it its inter intercession will succeed. Iranian. In fact, but Iran gave a very interesting e uh, interview the other day. The Iranian ambassador to India, he's actually advocated a bigger role for India in the Palestine uh, Hamas Israel con conflict, and basically said that India should use its good offices. I don't know who we have the good offices with, uh, whether they still Mahmud Abbas still values us at all. Uh, is another issue but on qatar i agree i don't think they would like to have their arms twisted by anyone whether it is iran or the us i think the amir will have to take a call and i think we need to reach out uh, to the amir directly i mean he's he's young he's smart you know he's savvy i'm sure he knows uh, you know but but is this is this kind of uh, you know i just want to finally end if i could with uh you know the steps that you see uh you know that you know with with the with deepak mittal and with the defense attache do you think we should actually go public with what the charges are or should we just take it well on the down down and low that depends because i'm not having seen the charges i am not in a position to say anything at all see it's like this in certain matters we cannot go public but at the same time if we don't go public then rumors will float mm. so it's a fine judgment you know it's it's a difficult uh, judgment but uh, only those who are in government can take that judgment make that judgment mm. cannot, mm. but i can point out the perils in being too opaque yeah perils in being too public Yeah, 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 and the point that you made about not taking it to the ICJ is also good because it hasn't helped Kulbushan Yadav at all. Not uh, only that, just... not only that, Qatar will say that these are matters of national security, so we are yeah. not why what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. don't forget, ICJ judgments are not enforceable. 
That's right. That's the other issue. Absolutely. So this is an added complication, uh, you know, which which nobody expected, you know. So let's see how it happen, how it uh, works out in the weeks and uh, weeks to come. Hopefully, there will be some kind of uh, you know rapprochement and some kind of breakthrough and uh, a clearer understanding of why these men have been charged and uh, how we can get around that. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just want to share with you. I mean, uh, you were referring to the Financial Times, is it? Yeah, uh, that's that's what I saw, yeah. yeah. Okay, I do not know, but I find it a little difficult to fi figure out, uh, to imagine that uh, Israel would have been engaged in spying. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I want to point out to a possibility. It's on, it is absolute speculation. Mm -hmm. See, we were talking earlier, the only people who might be worried about Qatar's in, in, uh, increasing its naval capabilities with Indian support. Because don't forget, though it's a private company, it is Indian naval personnel who are there. That's right. And and were I Qatari Foreign Secretary, I would have asked the Government of India formally to vet them. Mm, mm. Okay? Not the technical qualifications, but their service record. Yeah, yeah. Any a misdemeanor. Was yeah. there, you know what I mean? And I, exactly. I, I'm sure Qatar would have done that. So the idea that it's a private company, well, it is a private company, but there is much more to it than meets the eye. Okay, mm -hmm. that is, you know, very important point. And now, Israel has been mentioned. I do not know whether this is to confuse things. Mm -hmm. Only can, uh, state I can think of who might be worried will be UAE. Mm -hmm. It is UAE that has got a maritime border with. Uh, Qatar. Mm, mm, All right. Mm, mm. And Qatar, I don't think has any, you know, bad intentions towards UAE because you know that during the blockade, they were uh, supplying gas to Dubai. That's right. That's right. Nevertheless, now this is absolute speculation, no speculation. Yeah. So Israel wanted to uh, earn brownie points from UAE by doing the spying and mm. telling you yeah, this is what is happening suppose i leave it mm. in that's but, very interesting ambassador but there's also the other speculation that it could be pakistan because you know the naval uh our, our former retired naval officers run the ports across the gulf countries i mean you've you've seen it yourself i mean in dharan and Jeddah and you know, in Oman and all of that, it's uh, and in Dubai. I mean, I remember Jabal Ali Port when you went in and went out. It was always an Indian, uh, you know, former naval, uh, you know, junior officer, definitely who stamped your, you know, entry and exit. So I mean, it is in India, which is actually the backbone of all of these uh, countries, you know, a lot, to a great extent. And I think that is resented by the Pakistan uh, officers. Apparently, I mean, this is what somebody uh, said to me. One of the uh, one of the families said to me that it could be Pakistan playing dirty as well. Do you think that's even a possibility? No, I don't. I don't think. I, I think don't, it's. I, I don't think Pakistan has a necessary clout, and I don't think Qatar will fall for that. Yeah, yeah. But they have tried. That's not the point. Yeah. I yeah. don't. Qatar would have taken them seriously. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's hope that the death sentence gets commuted to life, and that we've set the meal, wheels in motion to get them safely out of this uh, terrible sentence and maybe get them home probably by Eid next year. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fabian, for coming on the show. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tiwari, again. Thank you, viewers, for watching. Please do click on the Global Express icon on the New Indian Express website and keep watching Global Express. Thank you.